In the 31st millennium, a galaxy-wide, all-consuming corruption of treachery spread. The flames ignited on Istvan gradually spread from one world to another, while the growing hunger of the fatal storm nullified interstellar communications and warp travel. However, the intensity of the conflict only increased, for even in the farthest corners of the Emperor of Mankind's dominions, loyalists and renegades clashed, trying to snatch a piece of victory at any cost. Soon, the virus of betrayal reached the Red Planet, which was blockaded for a long time. However, the new faith of Mars spread far beyond the solar system, and the Forge Worlds, loyal to the War Master, supplied his army with the necessary technologies. Later, they would enter history under the name Dark Mechanicum and continue to exist in the 41st millennium, and their worlds would become centers of nightmares born in the subconscious of tortured machines. Today, we will tell you about a small forge world located in the coronid deeps of Segmentum Obscurus, near the boundary with Ultima Segmentum. This relatively young dominion was founded shortly before the appearance of the nearby forge planets such as Mazoa and Mapandex. Its history begins around the end of the Great Crusade, when the Xeno Empires known as the Mitu Conglomerate was destroyed in the territory of the Coronid Deeps. In the ashes of the vanished civilization, a new forge world was founded with the goal of extracting minerals, plundering and subsequent analysis of Xenotech. In the final battle with the Xenos, the Mechanicum Warbark Cyclopean Mind was severely damaged and could not continue the joint maneuver with the Imperial Navy. The Tech Priests made an emergency landing on a planet located in the very heart of the ruins of the destroyed Empire. It was a rocky world, its surface plagued by electromagnetic storms. Its seas were polluted with sulphur, and among the broken plains of black volcanic rock, it was difficult to find signs of life. Apparently the Xenos had never settled in this place, so the minerals remained untouched. Soon the smokestacks of manufacturums reached for the sky. Bunkers and warehouses emerged deep under the planetary crust, and groups of explorers set out for the nearby dead worlds in search of alien tech relics. Thus, the Forge World was born, which remained on the pages of history under the name Cyclothrath, and the region under its control became known as the Cyclothrathine Holdfast. Researchers drawn to the collection of technologies permanently joined the local population, and as more and more astonishing technologies were discovered, the dual nature of Cyclothrath became apparent. Remaining an outpost of the Imperium, it became encrusted with destructive weapon systems and turned into a testing ground. The Synod of Cyclothrath was tasked with turning the outpost into a full-fledged forge world. However, this process was slow as the planet was too far from Mars and continued to suffer from magnetic storms. After the discovery of the dead planet Arion, the resource issue was resolved, for it was rich in minerals and deposits of various chemical compounds. Soon, large-scale mining complexes flooded Arion's surface, although this task was complicated by the critically high concentration of chlorine in the atmosphere. But this did not deter the Cyclothrather's magi, and soon throngs of Augmetics miners were thrown into these hellish mines, and the process of exploiting the planet's depths began despite the high mortality rate among the workers. By the end of the Great Crusade, Cyclothrather had achieved the status of a full-fledged forge world of Class Tertius II, but it faced a number of challenges. It is known that the world was on the verge of destruction due to a threat of unknown origin, the details of which are still kept in the Forge's data cores under a veil of secrecy. The enemies were ultimately defeated, but Cyclothrata changed its path of development and transformed into an extremely isolated, secretive and highly militant branch of the Mechanicum. Battle-hardened Magos almost completely severed ties with allied worlds of the Coronid Deeps, as well as with the Forges of Mazoa and Mpandex. Concerned by this turn of events, the emissaries of the Mazoan Mechanicum passed the information to Mars, but no investigation followed, possibly by direct order of Kelbor Hall. As a result, over time, the Magi of Cyclothrath earned a reputation for being extremely arrogant, secretive, and disdainful of the opinions of allied worlds. In some cases, it even became necessary to appeal to the court of the Segmentum to restrain their unbridled drive for expansion. At the dawn of the Horus heresy, it was evident that Cyclothrath adhered to its own development plans and operated in secret to avoid displeasing the authorities of neighboring systems. The court of the Segmentum, the Martian Synod, and Terra. The only connection they truly valued remained the pact with the Manichaean Commonwealth.
which supplied them with their convicts in exchange for technological treasures. The condemned were turned into servitors and sent to work in the chemical mines of Arian, where they perished within a few months. In the conditions of isolation, the traditions of the Cyclothrathine tech priests also underwent changes. The planet was still governed by the Synod of Archmagi, but the colours of their robes changed from the customary Martian crimson to a blood red with dark grey trim or even black. They despised the use of gold and silver for decorative purposes, preferring bare steel or sombre alloys to give their mechanisms a more menacing appearance. The warlike Cyclothrathas Tagmata significantly surpassed the forces of any other forge world of class Tertius in strength and number, and within their military formations an uncharacteristic tradition for the tech priest emerged of applying battle marks on the armour of automata, servitors, and even the limbs of the magi. The heraldic symbol of the forge became an image of a red spider placed on a white gear, whose legs were depicted as lightning bolts. This same symbol was emblazoned over their own heraldry by the knights of House Atrax, who were vassals of Cyclothrathor and based on Arian. It remains a mystery how such an ambitious branch of the Mechanicum drew the attention of the Warmaster, but the fact remains. Before the commencement of his rebellion, Horus secured the support of not only the Martian tech priests, but also diligently maintained connections with many remote forges, for whom Mars was at best a distant and unwelcome master. The Magi of Cyclothrathor supplied Horus with bizarre destructive mechanisms and legions of distorted automatons, which awaited their moment in the underground storages of their storm-ravaged world. It seems that the Synod of Cyclothrath placed no limitations on their research from the moment the forge was established, for creating such a number of automatons must have taken a considerable amount of time. When Horus's betrayal became evident, the forces of Cyclothrath were in no hurry to openly side with him and became even more reclusive. They amassed power and prepared, for what no one knew. Meanwhile, the horrors of the heresy came upon their allies. The Manichaean Commonwealth was an independent dominion within the Imperium, located to the east of the Cyclops Cluster. It was considered the main axis of Terran power in that region, thanks to two systems. The first was Manichaean itself, with its primary hive, Manichaea Visidae. The second was Port Mor, which at the time was still under construction and expansion, but was already one of the most potent bases of the Armada Imperialis in the northern realms of the Lord of Mankind. Port Moor itself was home to a significant fleet, numbering about 171st and 2nd rank line ships and nearly a thousand lower rank barges. Their primary tasks were border patrols, world protection and enforcement of imperial law. A combined army of 193 cohorts of the Solar Auxilia was stationed at secondary bastions in the Manichaean and Numinal systems. Such a contingent of Imperial forces would have been a reliable barrier on the way to Segmentum Solar and Holy Terror. But any sensible person would immediately ask, why did such mighty forces not come to the aid of the Cyclops Cluster? The answer is simple. The Warmaster did not allow them to do so, thanks to preemptive orders that had the fleets engaged in various regions. When word of the rebellion reached Port Moor, the fleets were recalled from their missions for a general muster in the system. By that time, the borders of the Manichaean Commonwealth were under attack from various types of enemies, but then calamity came from an unexpected direction. A gigantic space hulk, the Red Polyphemus, emerged in the system, inhabited by numerous orc warbands. The annihilation of the Wanderer drained a great deal of the Commonwealth's strength and resources, ultimately leading to orders for total mobilization and calls for aid to allied worlds such as Agathon and Numinal, who realized that should the Commonwealth fall, their own demise would follow. All available contingents were recalled from their assignments for a general assembly at Port Moor to confront what had once seemed unthinkable, the devastating invasion of the Death Guard from the now silent Cyclops Cluster. However, no one knew that everything was going according to the Warmaster's plan, for the Cyclothrathene Holdfast responded to the call for help. The situation in the Port Moor system was exceedingly dire and the local planetary governors and militant lords were doing everything within their power to counter the impending chaos. The docking bays of the planetoids were crammed full with innumerable squadrons of battleships, cruisers, escort barges and void servitors. Cargo barges, troop transports and orbital lictors buzzed everywhere. Each had a vital task and all were preparing for the horrific, with the entire system in a state of high alert. Reinforcement fleets were slowly arriving from the east, 
military ships from the domain of Agathon in dark bronze hues, pirate killers from the Serada Nebula, as well as the ominous grey war arcs of the Mechanicum Forge world of Cyclothrather. Void automata scuttling across their hulls like macabre insects. Refugees from dozens of besieged systems arrived in the forming void ship swamps. Among them were those who had survived the attack on the Cyclops cluster, a handful who had escaped the Istvan trap, along with throngs of trade ships and ore transporters. Some barges had sustained critical damage and had to be detonated in situ or sent to the system's outskirts on ghost drives to prevent harm. The massive congregation of void ships was a true headache for the human mind. So their movements were tracked and adjusted via the Astra Control Panopticon, a powerful Mechanicum beacon towering 10 kilometers from the south pole of Port Moore. Orders were transmitted from there, navigation coordinates were checked and corrected. Information was fed directly to ship helms, allowing quick course adjustments to avoid collisions. These commands could be overridden through manual control, making the system highly vulnerable. To avoid the worst, encryption codes were changed following the betrayal of Horus, then altered again after the bloody massacre on Istvan V. The Portmore Void Augury and Gas Override systems were believed by the Armada Command to still be impregnable against outside influence. Indeed, perhaps they would have proved so, except that the spider at the heart of this vast web, the Archmagos Light Mercuric, Cyber Ordinator of Portmore, was already secretly sworn to Horus. Under the hand of the treacherous Archmagos of Portmore, a fiendish web of conspiracy and malevolence had been forming, and its strands stretched far and wide across the Manichaean Commonwealth and its worlds, and out to the dominions of Agathon and the dual sons of Karada, at the furthest extreme of the Coronid Reet. This conspiracy had many layers and many agencies were bound up within it, from the traitor Archmagos Astral Mercuric and her acolytes, to several officer cadres of the Imperialis Armada who had been corrupted by strange rites and secret societies brought into their midst while serving alongside the Sons of Horus and the Word Bearers' Legions. Their numbers, particularly in relation to the billions of men and women under arms in the Manichaean Commonwealth, were in comparison very few, but they were well placed, and within such a tainted network it had been all too easy to ensure that forces and agents loyal to the Warmaster were where they would do the most harm when the time came. It all began when, somewhere in the panopticon of Port Moore, one of the control panels came to life under the lumen lights and a countdown began. Upon its completion, data networks ignited and scorched voxcasters throughout the system, augers were flooded with static noise and their scanners immediately shut down as if fearing a supernova burst. The vast, roiling fleet around Port Moore froze for a moment and then ships began to collide. Orbital data streams distributed false information to everyone. Barge engines suddenly fired at full power, turning the crews of smaller vessels into a bloody mess, and their command bridges were flooded with scrap code. Hundreds of ships within the system malfunctioned or misfired as the chaotic signal continued to pulse, while others had entire decks depressurized and opened to the void, thrusting their dying inhabitants into the cold vacuum of space. But the worst calamities befell only the smaller barges, as the large warships were too powerful and resilient to suffer from anything but exhaustion and confusion. But when they regained their senses, many suddenly found themselves under fire from those they considered allies. Ships that had prepared in advance for this stood ready. Accordingly, the info strike was not targeted at them. They opened fire on loyalists and flooded their Vox channels with demands to surrender. Then, on the decks of the surviving ships, Void shields flared to life, and sirens wailed, as crew members, now conscious of the bitter betrayal, took up combat positions and prepared for the fight. In the vast maze of corridors within Port Moor, battles erupted between traitors and loyalists. Quickly, the Provost Marshals organized a proper siege of the Panopticon Tower, but against the automated defenses set against them, they could achieve little. Fortunately, other, more competent troops arrived at the scene. The elite Veletaris of the 905th Solar Auxilia Cohorts, the Ash Scorpions. Veterans of dozens of hot zones carved their way forward, blasting bulkheads with melter bombs and rapier laser destroyers, suppressing any resistance with the crossfire of Volkite beams. As they approached the Panopticon generator, their situation became increasingly desperate as the very structure of the station turned against them, and they were forced to use flamers to clear the corridors of rampaging homunculus and darting servo-skulls that lunged at them like wild animals. Having infiltrated the colossal generator vault, 
they discovered an expansive chamber resembling a cathedral, housing five enormous plasma coils shrouded in lightning, each the size of a battle titan. Awkward tech priests, encased in heavy armor to withstand the proximity to the radioactive hell they tended to, were present here. Alongside them were steel spiders, a meter wide, grinning with human skull grins from the gantries and cable webs that adorned the vault. Dozens of servitors with vacant eyes, their flesh charred to blackness, watched over them. Behind all this, guarding the central control console, stood a group of Castellax class battle automata. Their bolt weapon aimed and rotated, transforming them into a lethal barrier through which nothing could penetrate. A battle ensued. The Ash Scorpions bravely advanced under a hail of gunfire, dashing from cover to cover as quickly as they could, trying to find a way through the labyrinth of consoles and panels towards the heart of the Generatorum. Soon the vault, reminiscent of a cave, filled with a hurricane of screeching energy discharges and roaring bolt rounds. Equipment exploded, filling the air with acrid smoke, steel claws bit into flesh, flamers spewed their fiery breath, grenades thundered, shredding bodies and splitting metal. Amidst the storm, the Castellaxes stood as an immovable wall, their armor scorched and smoking, as explosions and rounds pelted them like hail on stone. Until, from the smoke, emerged three tracked rapier batteries. The cutting beams of their laser emitters converged on the lead Castellax, sending it into burning oblivion. Sensing their moment had come, the Velotaris assault squads burst from cover and charged into the breach in the battle automata's ranks. Dozens perished to the bolt gun of a single Castellax, while others were pulverized by the heavy blows of servo claws. But like a pack of predators, they pounced on the armored giants, firing Volkite weapons at point-blank range into their joints. Soon another Castellax fell, writhing in blind fury as its legs were cut from under it. The Velitaris broke through and attacked the awaiting tech priests. Only a single Velitari, whose name wasn't even recorded, clad in blood-splattered void armor, managed to break through the chaos and carnage to the control console dais. He plunged his power sword directly into the heart of the machine, causing the dais to erupt in a blazing white fireball. Deadly arcs of lightning burst from the cores of the massive plasma reactors. Emergency protocols kicked in, and misdirected energy hit the condensers on the walls. In the end, nearby humans and machines were turned to ash. The radio signal covering Port Moore stuttered and then ceased entirely. For a moment, ship crews were bewildered by the sudden onset of silence, but soon the Vox network was flooded with orders, ultimatums, and calls for surrender. A line was quickly drawn, dividing friends and foes, and a semblance of leadership among the Loyalists took form. On board the colossal frigate Triumph of Reason, an assassination attempt on Admiral Le Bray was thwarted. He swiftly quelled the mutiny and took command. His first order was for the ramming cruiser Kurga to eliminate the Panopticon. The awakening ship turned and directed its ramming beaks towards the now silent spire of the Mechanicum. Soon the ten-kilometer tower shuddered from the impact. Explosions rippled through its structure, and it shattered like rotten wood. The remnants of the Panopticon drifted into the void. Gradually, the battle in space began to take on a semblance of order, even though disoriented ships still fired indiscriminately, and the Loyalist and Renegades slowly coalesced into two nominal camps. On the outer edge of this quagmire of ships, the fighting was less intense. There were significantly fewer mutinies, but the crews were still recovering from the hostile Song of Chaos. They still did not understand what was happening, and here a wolf lurked among the sheep. Among the ranks of Loyalist cruisers that had come to aid from distant Agathon, one ship moved almost unnoticed. It had not yet taken sides, but was amidst the Loyalist formation. Suddenly it activated its maneuvering thrusters and began to close in. It was the barrel-shaped arc of the Mechanicum named Arithmetic of Violence, belonging to the Tagmata Cyclothrata. Slowly, its thick hull began to fall apart, like the petals of a wilting flower. And when the arc had completely disintegrated, instead of rows of decks, rows of void torpedoes came into view. Their engines ignited with divine synchronicity, and like a swarm of bees, the deadly mechanisms hurtled towards their pre-designated targets. The sudden flashes of the destruction of dozens of ships were so bright that even the gas and dust clouds of the nearest nebulae reflected the light. But it was not this that terrified the Loyalists, but the fact that the flash illuminated the approaching black ships in the darkness of space. At first they were mistaken for reinforcements from the Raven Guard, but it was too late to discover that Korax's banners were torn from them and their hulls were scorched. But the Colossus that followed them was even more terrifying. 
for no officer of the Imperial Navy could mistake it for anything else. It was the vengeful spirit, flagship of the War Master. Soon Port Moor fell, the survivors swore allegiance to the Warlord, and the port became a supply and repair base for Horus's supporters in the northern regions of the Imperium. Traitor ships and war machines were distributed among dozens of captured sectors. Approximately 60 battleships remained at Port Moor to maintain control over the worlds of the Manichaean Commonwealth. The anchor shipyards were managed by the Dark Mechanicum, while six cohorts of Horus loyal soldiers of the Solar Auxilia became the local garrison. The hives of Manichaea were turned into giant slave camps. After the conquest of Port Moor, the warlike magi of Cyclothrata focused on the western worlds of the Coronid Deeps. Most of the Tagmata was deployed in Horus's armies, and the remaining cohorts of the Dark Mechanicum were drawn into a prolonged war for the planet Numenal and a number of nearby systems. They were led by the brutal Archmagos Yelav Drykovac. Before the onset of the Horus heresy, nothing was known about him, but he soon became one of the most hated representatives of the Dark Mechanicum. He was the military emissary and chief field commander of his Cyclothrathine, Tagmata, and reported only to the enigmatic Synod of his Electrostorm-ravaged planet. He also bore the title of Sovereign Relate of the vassal knighthouse Atrax. Although they had their own lords and liege lords, the knights had sworn fealty to the Magi of Cyclothrathe and eventually turned into Dracovac's puppets. Numenal was first conquered when Horus began subjugating worlds for his future empire, but he did not leave a garrison on the surface to avoid wasting precious human resources on guarding a mere agri-world. But in the eighth year of the 31st millennium, the planet was attacked again, this time by forces bearing the spider-like symbol of the Cyclothrethine Holdfast. The resistance was broken, but not completely annihilated, as the surviving soldiers of the Solar Auxilia split into guerrilla units. They had extensive experience in conducting combat operations in the marshy terrain of Numinal, which became a real curse for the heavy war machines of the Mechanicum. However, Dracovac expected that the resistance would soon be suppressed, so he departed, leaving behind powerful forces to guard the new possessions of the Holdfast. On Numinal V's dusty moon, Quachil, a carefully fortified navigation beacon and astropathic relay was built, and on the planet's main continent, a base was constructed to control Numinal. Although Numinal was an agri-world whose production needed to be maintained, Dracovac was interested in a completely different resource, human flesh. Using a procedure called ad secularis lobotomization, the planet's civilian population was turned into servitors, destined to replenish the ranks of the Cyclothrathe Mechanicum. The forced processing of the local population increasingly forced them to take up arms, and Dracovac had to return. After landing on the planet, he first ripped out the remaining brain of the Margos he had left in his place, and then developed a plan for the orderly processing of Numenor's population. The planet's continents were divided into sectors, which were processed in turn. By Dracovac's order, massive amphibious crawlers were designed and manufactured, containing surgical chambers, corpse disposal locks, and protein reclamation vats. These nightmarish machines moved with the accompaniment of knights from House Atrax and other clumsy war machines. No guerrilla unit could withstand such an escort, but the Magi did not expect that someone else was planning against them. The initial assault was not directed at Numinal. Instead, the astropathic relay station on Quachil was attacked first. The initial sign of danger was the sudden appearance of a battered fleet of ships, led by a ship with a ruby hull belonging to the rogue trader Sharid Udin. The vessel was identified as the Hammer of the Deep, known to be under the allegiance of the War Master. The tech priests allowed them to approach closer, as they broadcasted proper Vox codes and requested permission to trade and replenish supplies. It was only too late that they understood the Hammer of the Deep had long been captured by the Knights of House Orlac when the reckless rogue trader arrived with the War Master's ultimatum. The battle erupted quickly, but the Xeno technology enhanced firepower of the Galias demonstrated clear superiority. Under the cover of the Hammer of the Deep guns, several warp drummonds detached from the fleet and headed toward Quachil's surface. A smaller strike corvette of the Pylum class broke away from the main drummon and engaged in combat. It flew at low altitude to clear a landing zone near the communications tower. Behind it, the massive drummonds encountered little resistance and clumsily landed on the dust dunes, causing a minor earthquake. The enormous doors of the cargo bays opened to release dozens of super-heavy Dracosan armoured transports and numerous auxiliary squadrons of Lehman Russ battle tanks. 
A colossal armoured wedge surged forward through the dust storm. The armour bore the dull bronze and dark emerald heraldry once characteristic of the solar auxilia of the 60th Expeditionary Fleet of the Great Crusade and a crest-crowned white helm, symbol of Agathon. Soon tarantula weapons batteries emerged from the sands and unleashed a barrage of fire on the advancing tanks, but inflicted little damage. The tarantulas were swept away and crushed under the tracks of the lemon rust tanks, which stormed towards the complex's walls and fired upon them. Under their onslaught, towers tilted, gun embrasures crumbled, and defensive walls collapsed. The battle-worn corvette hovered over the station's central complex of Auspex Towers. Several figures of Astartes in grey armour descended from it on jump packs, while the Hammer of the Deep turned toward Numenal, and the entire fleet followed. Five hours after the assault on Quachil began, contact with it was lost. The Hammer of the Deep and its escort vessels attacked the Mechanicum's orbital ships. The situation became so dire that moments before losing contact with Quachil, the warlike Magos Yelaf Drakovac was forced to withdraw his warship, the Sacra Astra, as the attacking galleas significantly outgunned it. The Bellicose Magos cut off direct command and took personal control of thousands of men and automata. Within mere hours, he had gathered dispersed continental forces for a counterattack. Meanwhile, the attacking fleet landed on the surface facing virtually no resistance. They concentrated in the least populated chain of archipelagos in the northern hemisphere of the planet. After seven hours, the Tagmata had gathered in sufficient numbers and Dracovac directed the troops northward. Initially, the Tagmata dispatched fast-moving scout drones to the area to assess the enemy from a close distance. The invaders were identified as solar auxilia forces numbering approximately 40,000 infantrymen equipped with several thousand units of armoured vehicles. Dracovac concluded that their iconography corresponded to the long-disbanded 60th Expeditionary Fleet, but they used observed unit designations and numbers that did not match historical records. The invaders did not commence an immediate attack, but instead entrenched themselves, preparing defensive lines and supply depots, laying minefields and digging trenches with astonishing speed and efficiency to meet the advancing Mechanicum forces. This led the Archmagos to several conclusions. It was a hostile loyalist army dispatched from Agathon territory. Additionally, no known warship in Agathon liveries had yet been spotted among the attacking forces. The assailants refrained from massive orbital bombardment, limiting themselves to a few strikes only on anti-orbital batteries that could interfere with their landing and had not yet tried to breach the void-shielded bastions of the Mechanicum control hubs. Apparently, the Agathians intended to capture the planet as intact as possible. Furthermore, they seemed to be preparing a beachhead for the arrival of a much larger contingent of Agathon forces. Analyzing the gathered intelligence, Dracovac reinforced the attacking waves en route to the landing zone to maintain pressure while simultaneously amassing forces for a second wave. In the shale deposits and rocky wastelands of the northern archipelago, Agathian cohorts awaited the assault. Units of heavy infantry and tracked heavy weapon batteries entrenched themselves, forming fire squares and defensive echelons behind prefabricated redoubts and swiftly dug trenches. Under the vigilant eye of Lord Marshal Ayrton Massad, Every hill, shoal and ravine was utilised for the most effective defence, ensuring channels of predictable advancement and deadly killing zones for the forthcoming events. Massad had fought on a hundred worlds and against countless forms of nightmarish xenos of formidable strengths, and even the secret technological might of the Mechanicum did not faze him, for he had fought alongside them in the past and knew their strengths and weaknesses. He prepared for this battle and had arranged for the production of specific weaponry, on Agathon beforehand. Such devices were rarely used and only in extreme situations against the most powerful Xenos during the Great Crusade, significantly enhancing the soldiers' ranged weaponry effectiveness but at the cost of high battery strain. Lord Marshal knew that the charged capacitors would be invaluable against the battle automata and enhanced warriors of the Mechanicum. When the first waves of enemy warriors began to crash against the Agathian cohort's fortifications, he realised he would soon see whether his strategy would be vindicated. The first servitors advanced without fear or remorse, their clumsy metal bodies emerging from the water or descending from the hovering barges of short-range lictor transports. Larger, manta ray-like flying machines dove and deployed Triaros transporters and Krios tanks right behind the advancing line. The only noise they made was the grinding of mechanisms and the roar of engines. The Cyclothrata Tagmata advanced in complete silence, without a single overarching will, the will of the Dracovac. Long-range artillery batteries struck them, 
sending clouds of dust and fragments of rock into the air. But from the craters rose the scarred automata once again, their spectral army advancing in an 11-kilometer-wide front, heedless of mines, the barrage of cannon shells and laser fire. Some of the battle automata staggered under the weight of fire. Some fell, but few, very few. Now the Mechanicum's guns responded, thunderous bolt cannons spouting fire and lightning weaponry unleashing their searing wrath, breaching the defensive lines and tearing bodies to pieces. Despite all this, the Agathian cohorts did not falter. They fired and fired again, answering the disciplined commands of their sergeants with measured volleys. On the Loyalist side, casualties began to mount as the Mechanicum forces closed to optimum firing range. The 48th Infantry Tertio suffered heavy losses, but steadfastly held their ground. Now only a few hundred metres separated the opposing forces, and from the ranks of the Tagmata, Vorax Automata burst forth at dizzying speed on their scythe-like legs, their power blades humming in anticipation of slaughter. Then, Massad finally gave the order. With practice swiftness, the power sources were extracted from the smoking lasers, and bulky capacitors were installed in their place. As one, the infantry opened fire, and the air was torn by flashes of lightning. The Vorax-class battle automata at the forefront took the brunt of the damage, and nearly disappeared entirely in deafening explosions and sprays of molten metal. Behind them, the Castellax automata stumbled forward, as if they were men caught in a sudden powerful headwind. Their energy fields crackled like enraged hornets, and their ceramite plates shattered and splintered in dozens of places as they were pierced through by laser blasts. Meanwhile, other assault automata successfully penetrated the Agathian's defensive lines to eliminate the commander, only to be thwarted by vigilant members of the general's personal guard and destroyed by their Volkites. Two more attempts on Massad's life were foiled in the same manner before the battle reached its bloody conclusion. The loyalists fiercely held their positions. When one soldier retreated to reload his weapon, another took his place, and keen artillerymen targeted the damaged Castellax and finished them off. Multi-laser beams zipped past them, targeting the downed servitors and smoking automata. Soon, a second wave of blaster fire hit the Tagmata, then a third and a fourth, leaving only the heavy units of the Dark Mechanicum. A few Krios tanks with intact force shields and the cumbersome Thanatars with blackened hulls, as their armor was impervious even to the artillery fire of the Auxilia, remained. The Thanatars held their positions but did not advance further and their bulbous mortars lobbed white plasma balls into the Loyalists' defensive structures, turning the impact zones into blazing hellscapes. The earth between the Tagmata and the Agathians, scarred by the explosions, turned into an ashen wasteland, while behind the lines of artillery, Automata, the Magos of Cyclothrathy, along with their heavily armoured bodyguards, waited. They did not wish to take risks and advance to the Agathians' positions only upon the arrival of reinforcements. For a while, the Mechanicum's attack faltered. Hundreds of kilometres away, Yelav Drakovac saw the entire situation through the eyes of hundreds of servitors and automata. Warning runes and inscrutable equations flashed in his cogitator-enhanced consciousness, indicating grim results. The Agathians had displayed resilience and unity and outmatched him in every respect, causing Cyclothrathi's Tagmata to suffer more losses in the first wave than in the last two years of active combat. Nevertheless, Dracovac still saw a path to victory. He needed to clear the landing zones of invaders, then fully capture the surface before commencing the void battle. He could only neutralize the Loyalist fleet at the cost of his flagship and the entire escort fleet of the Dark Mechanicum. Such was the harsh arithmetic of war. Dracovac left his stronghold fully armed and surrounded by bodyguards from the Covenant of Thalax. His body was enveloped in the shimmering curtain of Triaros Testudo force shields, capable of protecting their master from aerial attacks. Around him, the grey-black ranks of his personal combat automata formed up, and behind them stood the knights of House Atrax and the raiders of House Iothean. Overhead, macrobarges began carving a path to the archipelago where the combat was taking place. Yelav Drakovac went to war in person. Overseeing the amassed forces of the Tagmata, Iritan Massad himself watched through the telescope from the command tank's tower, he understood his opponent's tactics well, for he once fought in the ranks of the Warmaster himself and comprehended the significance of a decapitating strike in warfare. He had reserved this blow precisely for such a moment, aiming to shatter the Mechanicum's forces at their point of maximum cohesion rather than flushing them out of each factory like partisans. 
At his command, the engines of the Hammer of the Deep roared to life, and the cargo bay doors opened, releasing two ancient Cobalt-class landing ships. The surviving transports of the Dark Mechanicum moved to intercept, but the Goliath took the fire upon itself. The two transports flew over the Tagmata forces and landed behind them in shrub-covered wastelands. Their side ramps unfolded, and a unique ancient alarm signal echoed across the surface. It was the ancient challenge of a knight to a duel. Around fifty knights bearing the heraldic symbol of a manticore, emblem of House Orlac, emerged from the transports, a house lost from their home planet even before the Warmaster's claw plunged into the Coronid Deeps. Walking beside them were knights of House Hermetica and the exiled knights of House Iathion, who had come to punish their brethren for their betrayal. It was Valdemar Orlac, the High Seneschal of the Night House, who had commandeered the rogue trader's ship now hanging in orbit. And it was he who had struck a deal with Irritan Massad. The price of the deal was the dark planet on the border of the Agathon Dominion, and now the Knights of Orlac had come to seal the pact with blood. Loyalists charged, their weapons spat deadly fire and glowed white-hot. The Tagmata forces instantly turned and responded with deadly arcs of Volkite projectors and bolts of dark lightning. The Knights of Orlac split and flanked the enemy, while the rest formed a battle wedge and struck at the center. As the god machines closed the distance, Dracovac realized his knights were slower, albeit more heavily armored. He began to pull the mental strings of his mechanical puppet. His army formed into a hexagon and moved as a single unit. The Magos himself floated in the center of the force, under the protection of power fields and combat automatons. Soon, the complex maneuver of the loyalists was completed, and the knights of Orlac, along with their allies, closed ranks around the knights of Atrax. The ground shook, and the air filled with thunder as the god machines clashed in a devastating battle. Weapons fired at point-blank range, power spears thrust forward to penetrate armor plates, and ion shields flared and extinguished. Beams of white-hot thermal cannons pierced hulls, causing adamantium to melt, and mighty servo claws tore metallic limbs from joints. Where the Atrax fought with cold, calculated brutality, the Knights of Orlac fought like madmen. But the highest degree of hostility was exhibited by the Knights of House Iathion, when they encountered and annihilated their brothers in battle. In such chaos of endless bloodshed, even the enhanced combat automatons of Cyclothrata proved to be nothing when of the Knights of Orlac unleashed fury their chainswords. Soon it was the turn of the Archmagos bodyguards, cut down by the bolt cannon fire of the Castigator. However, the Knights of House Hermetica who attacked him quickly paid for their mistake. They were suppressed by salvos of heavy graviton cannons, and then squads of Vorex cleaved through their vital nodes with scythe-like limbs. In the end, the Archmagos personally tore every living pilot from the seats of the knights attacking him. The apocalyptic confrontation of the knights continued, and at the heart of this storm, Yelaf Dracovac oversaw hundreds of other clashes on the planet's surface through the eyes of automata and battle servitors. In the northern archipelago, the second wave of Tagmata forces was pushed back to the sea after reinforcements arrived from the Agathian cohorts. Throughout the planet, insurgents gained strength and began destroying conversion crawlers. New forces joined the fray after the arrival of three attack speeders. One was in the colors of the Raven Guard, and the other two adorned in the livery of the Imperial Fists. Additionally, a space marine in armor cleansed of heraldry appeared at one of the flesh processing factories and began killing everyone in the complex. The battle in the void also portended no favorable outcome, and the damaged barge Sacra Astra was still in a state of repair in the far orbit. Were Yelav Dracovac a space marine, he wouldn't think of defeat and would fight to the last, embracing a heroic death afterward. But he was the tech priest, and the language of equations and cold logic indicated he was losing. Obeying a silent command, the hexagonal formation of Cyclothraith troops began to change, and the bloody battle turned into a tactical retreat. Soon, the Mechanicum shipyards and command centers complex became a burning wasteland, its surface littered with the wrecks of combat automata, servitors, and the knights of house attracts. They had sacrificed themselves so the Archmagos could survive. He left the planet in a rescue capsule, giving the remaining combat units one last order. Kill, kill, and kill everyone they encountered until they themselves perished. Numenal remained in the hands of the Loyalists. Four weeks after the planet's complete liberation of Battlefleet, Agathon attacked Cyclothrothine, Tagmata Carada Secundus. 
but was repelled with heavy losses. However, their presence forced the forces of the Dark Mechanicum to retreat to safer worlds to regroup and hold an uneven front. The liberation of Numenol instilled confidence in the guerrilla units of the Loyalists in the Coronid Deeps, and the emboldened soldiers attacked the traitors wherever they could. The further fate of Yelav Dracovac is unknown, but his personal war with the Imperium continued even after the Great Purge. The Great Synod of Martian declared him an heretic ultima. He's credited with the genocide of Goth, atrocities in the Lucene Travesty, the death of the Seventeen Worlds of the Donia League in the 31st millennium. His warship Sacra Astra became a space wanderer and was found drifting in the maelstrom. Encrypted in its info core were details about the Dark Mechanicum, which subsequently fell into the possession of the Adeptus Terror. This ominous archive contains numerous previously unknown strategic reports, personal analyses and battle data directed personally by Dracovac, including a detailed account of the counteroffensive on Numenor. It is possible that from this same archive we have received information about other heretic forges. For instance, the forge world of Incaladian was a world engulfed in an unending cycle of wars, disputes and invasions that shook it until the arrival of the forces of the Great Crusade. After the Mechanicum Ark landed here during the Age of Strife, Incaladian was ideal for transformation into a forge world due to its mineral resources and other natural compounds. However, unstable warp currents brought less desirable travellers to it. Records of the centuries of its founding remain fragmentary, but it is certain that battles with numerous invaders were nearly constant. As a result, Incaladian transformed into an independent and very militant faction, which had to rely solely on itself. The wave-like invasions of Xenos forced the Magi to venture into unusual technological developments, and fortified cities grew on the planet's surface to protect the mineral-rich and algae-abundant seas, while industrial forges nestled under the Earth's mountainous crust. The Magi of Incaladian were also forced to raid feral worlds to replenish the ranks of slaves and servitors, but inadvertently brought echoes of barbarian cultures that began to spread slowly among the planet's schismatic machine cults. Throughout this long and brutal history, Legio Fureans constituted the main military force of the ruling Archmagos, known as the Preceptor General. No resources were spared in the maintenance of the Titans, and their combat power was augmented during the lulls between battles. Their more common nickname, Tiger Eyes, also originated from this early period as a corrupt name given to them by the wild tribes of the neighbouring world. For these tribes, the Titans were indeed divine and terrible beings, coming to reap the rewards, the sacrifices of the young and strong, to serve in the army of the gods. Unlike some garrison legions of the Titans before the Great Crusade, the Legio Furians did not stand watch as enforcers for minor empires serving the machine god, but rather waged unceasing war against numerous enemies. Over the centuries, they unleashed their wrath on invading hordes of orc marauders and repelled raids by Eldari corsairs. However, such unceasing conflicts took their toll on both Incaladian itself and the Titans defending the planet. Approximately fifty standard years before the discovery of the Forge World by the Imperium, the last vestiges of the feudal order of Tagmata Omnisia fell. In the ensuing internecine strife, the Preceptor General of Incaladian was killed and society splintered into warring factions, bereft of control and coordination, making it open for invasion and the subsequent devastation. By the time the vanguard of the Great Crusade reached Incaladian, the planet had become a global battlefield where a dozen different armies clashed. The Mechanicum, Renegades and Xenos equally unleashed atomic fire and even more brutal weaponry upon each other. During this period, the shattered and outnumbered Tiger Eyes refused to retreat, mercilessly punishing countless enemies until they were but a shadow of their former might, reduced to defending the last forged temple of the dead regent. Mars was determined to bring Incaladian back into the fold of the Imperium, but the Great Crusade at that time was engaged in major battles on multiple fronts, and much of the Mechanicum's armed forces were involved in ongoing campaigns. Instead, the vanguard forces of the 4th Legion of the 8th Expeditionary Fleet had to bear the brunt of the Liberation Campaign. Incaladian was annexed into the Imperium. The lost forges and fortress citadels were restored and repaired by the now ruling faction of the Mechanicum, loyal to Terra. Squadrons of warships for the first time gave the forge world respite from assault, and the enormous mineral wealth and production capacity were quickly harnessed to fuel the ever-expanding Great Crusade. When the Horus Heresy began, 
The tiger eyes sided with the War Master, along with Legio Mortis and the Fabricator General of Mars. In hindsight, it is clear that Incaladian knew of the betrayal in advance, for half of the Legio had been sent to Paramar on Horus's orders long before the massacre at Istvan V. It is known that after the Great Purge it was decided to reclaim Incaladian for the Imperium once more. And now this forge world again functions for the benefit of Terra, but the archives hold records of a renegade Margos named Inar Satarael, who participated in the Siege of Terra. His service record began in the ravaged forge world of Incaladion, where he fought against external invaders. Repelling one brutal attack after another, he increased his power and status among his peers until he gained a seat on the ruling council of Margos. However, later, in a battle against a rare race of Xenos known as the Carnoplasm, his flesh was liquefied and drained from his body. Strange as it may seem, Satarael survived this assault, but his consciousness remained in the damaged cogitator blocks of his body. He later used servitors to restore his organic parts through artificial biomass augmentation. After regenerating the cerebral cortex, he was reborn, but since then, rumors have spread that he became more akin to a malevolent warrior scientist, whose mind was obsessed with thoughts of immortality. When the Great Crusade began, the rulers of Incaladian were more than happy to grant Satarel his own independent command, so that he would leave the planet sooner. For decades he served alongside the flotillas of Horus, and after the rebellion began, he joined the Master of War. During the Siege of Terror, Satarael emerged as the commander of Dark Mechanicum forces and took part in the assault on the Lionsgate spaceport. Together with the Obliterator Volk, they implanted a demonic computer virus into the spaceport systems. His subsequent fate remains unknown. Somewhere in the Soul System there exists a world named Abhelung, which translates from High Gothic as healing. The planet once served as a midway transport hub between Armageddon and Paramar, but all of its early history has been lost over the long millennia. Survivors dispatched there along with the Inquisition reported that Abhelung is now lost to the Imperium. They claim that elements of the Dark Mechanicum, hidden beneath the planet's surface, employed forbidden tech pyroclasm rituals to simultaneously activate numerous dormant volcanoes, resulting in the deaths of millions. From the swirling black clouds and rivers of molten rock emerged a countless horde of demonic machines. It is estimated that the population of Abhelung was either killed, consumed, or dragged underground in chains to service infernal forges. Many within the Inquisition believe that Abhelung is now entirely within the hands of the Dark Mechanicum, who seemingly have hidden in dark subterranean labyrinths for centuries. Although this acknowledgement infuriates many in the Imperial government, Abhelung now stands no chance of liberation. Moreover, it is highly likely that the Forge World will soon become a pivotal center for the production of demonic machines and an invaluable ally for the Chaos Legions. Of another fallen forge in the Segmentum Solar, even less is known, as it emerged long before the Great Crusade began and has never been discovered. However, Imperial Astropaths report hearing periodic binary chanting within the Empyrean from one of the regions in the Segmentum. Inquisitors have also heard rumors of a lost world where the Dark Mechanicum worships a giant altar in the form of a Cyclopean machine. Inquisition agents believe this altar to be an as yet undiscovered standard template construct, the application of which remains unknown. The Holy Ordos have mobilized their resources to locate the system and ascertain the current status of this forge, known in records as Crucible Omega. Another, no less sinister stronghold of heretics is known as the Irongast Foundry. This is an industrial hell on a planetary scale, capable of driving most mortals insane, as this forge world is entirely dedicated to corn. Bristling with bronze gun towers, the planetary factory is practically impregnable, ruled by a conclave of warsmiths led by a slave trader known as the Overseer. According to their sworn vows, as long as there remains even a single soul on the planet capable of operating its countless mechanisms, the Irongast Foundry will never cease to produce weapons for the countless wars in the name of the Blood God. The Foundry produces everything from chain axes and hellbrute sarcophagi to vast demon engines such as the Lord of Skulls and Lord of Battles. Their blood-encrusted runic circles flare night and day, dragging demons from the Empyrean to be bound into rank upon rank of waiting demon engines. This is a place of vast, horrific industry and serves as the weapons factory for a great many corn demonkin warbands. In return, they demand raw materials, junked war engines, precious metals and corpses harvested from the fields of war. Retlaxi. 
The name of this ancient fief of the Mechanicum of old was thought long consigned to history. Yet in the manner of so many things damned by the stain of the warp, it resurges periodically to instill doubt and fear in the souls of the faithful. Having lain dormant for the better part of eight Terran centuries, the name has appeared once more in at least a dozen confirmed remote prognostications, several readings of the Emperor's Tarot, and at least one recorded communion with a ritually summoned and bound etheric entity. The world was once a subject of the Traitor Collegia, Titanicus Legio Mortis, and so it is the Imperium's greatest concern that its foundries, if still they function, may be supplying arms and ammunition to this arch-traitor body. The matter of the appearance of the demon engines codified as decimators has been the subject of several previous conjunctions, and the majority of the Inquisition are agreed that the source of these vile hybrids of machine, demon and xenos artifice lies beyond the Lana Rifts in the region known to the Imperium as the Silent Abyss. Having gathered together a number of transcriptions of post-mortem confessions extracted by way of the Thanatos Protocols, Inquisitors are now certain that the long outlawed heretics of the Septral cult are in contact with the source of the Decimators, which they apparently know as the Silent Forge. Furthermore, these transcriptions link several renegade Adeptus Astartes warbands to the Silent Forge, suggesting that the Septral are serving in the capacity of brokers, facilitating the armies of the Great Enemy and gaining the services of these mighty engines of war. What the Silent Forge demands in return, or what share of that price the emissaries of the Septral claim can only be guessed at, but no doubt speak to the very depths of sin and blasphemy. The name Temporia appears in but a handful of archives, all of them penned by the hands of heretics long ago consigned to the pyre. To name such a place is to invite into the soul a portion of the madness and unreality in which it is steeped, and in doing court the damnation so many have unto. In his vision, the captive warpseer known as the Oracle of Brass describes an impossible realm of cogs and arcane mechanisms the size of continents and mountain ranges that can only relate to a hellforge dedicated to the ruinous power known as the Changer of the Ways. Further assayances have served to solidify the Inquisition's view that Temporia is a hellforge entirely in the sway of that power, and that it exists, at least partially, deep within the heart of the Eye of Terror. This gargantuan mechanism turns in patterns mortals cannot and should not fathom, for they can only serve the cause of their destruction and ruination. During the so-called Crusade into the Abyss, Temporia was discovered by the Knights Excelsior. They had no inkling of what this world was and landed on its surface without prior preparation, only to be attacked by demonic machines unleashed upon them by the warpsmith Valadrak. Outnumbered, the Knights Excelsior began retreating back to their shuttles, but too late discovered that their void ships were attacked by strange archaeotech. Ultimately, the Space Marines could not escape, and later transformed into a warp band called the Magma Hounds. Significantly later, before the birth of the Great Rift, as a result of an engineering feat that could have only entered the mind of a madman, Temporia emerged from the Eye of Terror with the aid of demon-possessed gravitational tractors. Its sprawling foundries spewed thousands of possessed machines that attacked the Cadian Gate. Additionally, during the 13th Black Crusade in the year 999 of the 41st millennium, the forge world Agrippina attempted to disrupt the supply of demonic machines to the forces of Abaddon the Despoiler and attack Temporia. Cohorts of the Legio Cybernetica and conclaves of Electro-Priests exchanged lightning discharges created by Valadrak's tech demons. The battle monsters of Temporia were enormous, but the machines of Agrippina did not fall short in their power, driven by their faith in the Omnissiah. For each wave of horrors from the depths of Temporia, Agrippina dispatched fresh reinforcements. More detailed accounts of Temporia have since been lost, and rumours suggest that the battle continues to this day. Another forge with a cursed fate bears the name Toil, which in a free translation from High Gothic means arduous labour. In the year 400 of the 32nd millennia, the demon Primarch Perturabo perverted the eight rituals of possession, turning them against his enemies. Invoking Nurgle, Perturabo imbued his curse with extreme contagion and released it into the mechanical systems of toil, a former Imipriel vassal forge world. Raw chaos spreads through the machines, and the hidden manufacturums begin to change. On the eighth day, giant cables burst from the earth, demonic machines hunted the living, and many-legged cathedrals of industry prowled the wastes. The planet was ultimately scoured of all native flesh, 
and has been transformed into a world shaped by the unreality of the Immaterium. Recent reports indicate that the Adeptus Mechanicus domain of Uraniborg 1572 has fallen from the grace of the Emperor, its foundries turned to the production of the tools of damnation at the behest of traitor Magi and the status of its attendant Titan Legion, the Legio Serpentis. Unknown. It is the Inquisition's belief that, given current commitments in that region, and the continued uncertainty regarding the fate or loyalty of the Legio Serpentis, Uraniborg 1572 is, to all intents and purposes, lost to the Imperium. Concluding the tale of Heretic Forges, one must mention the most mysterious and grim forge hidden beyond the borders of Imperial maps, in the darkness of the wild and distant void, where even in the times of the Horus heresy, Xenos and degenerate human enclaves hunted one another. From there, raids into the Thramas sector were frequently launched, but the region was deemed of no value to the Imperium, as in the 31st millennium, no one wished to expend the resources of the Great Crusade to establish order. In the years preceding the Thramas Crusade, there were legends of a wandering predator forge, the result of the fusion of horrifying hostile technologies. It prowled the systems beyond the Imperium and devoured entire worlds to satiate its hunger. The truth that later came to light was no less terrifying than these legends, for everything about this forge proved to be even more dreadful. Its name was Ulan Huda. It is known that it was a young forge stuck among the isolated systems of ghoul stars. Bereft of contact with Mars and surrounded by hordes of malevolent Xenos, the Archmagos saw only one way to survive, to become even more dreadful. The first Tekmagos of Ulan Huda procured technologies considered forbidden and remade their home beyond recognition, utilizing equipment that could harm the very fabric of reality. Deep within the volcanoes, they installed massive engines so that the planet could travel through the warp and transition at will into real space. In their struggle for survival, Ulan Huda devoured the weak and fled from the strong. Defeated enemies were absorbed by this predatory forge, their worlds turned into dust, and their population transformed into servitors. Samples of human Xenos technologies were embedded into the transformed shell of the planet, and such modifications continued until the planet ceased to resemble itself. Its rulers could no longer be considered sane. Such a horrifying creation could not be welcomed in the Imperium for its transgressions and use of Xeno technologies. However, records found in the ruins of the Tsagwalsa indicated that the Night Lords intentionally hid the Predator Forge from Terra's eyes in exchange receiving forbidden technologies of exotic slaves, as well as illegally created Titans of Legio Phasma. The truth about this alliance was revealed at the concluding stage of the Thramas Crusade, when the Night Lords brought Ulan Huda into battle against the Imperium, aiming to turn the tide of battle in their favor. During one of the engagements, the forge was mutilated by the fleet of the Dark Angels, but no loyalist report mentioned its destruction. Moreover, during the Great Scouring, there were mentions of encounters with grim forges in the most remote corners of the Imperium. But when representatives of Terra arrived there, they found nothing but war-torn border outposts. It seems that the Predator Forge once again disappeared into the shadows of legends and nightmares, and its dark legend takes on even more terrifying features at the thought that it still exists and hides somewhere in the galactic dark, where the boundaries of the Imperium end. Its fate is shared by dozens, perhaps even a hundred defiled forges of the Dark Mechanicum, in each of which a grim Archmagos is the king and god. To them flock warp bands of chaos and demons of the warp, willing to give everything in exchange for the right to own their blessed mechanisms. And the currency of exchange rarely changes, raw materials and millions of living souls to satiate the eternal hunger of the demonic factories. And as long as the heretics' forges exist, the war against the Imperium will never end.